Today's topic is really all about taking personal responsibility for your own growth rather than tucking your tail between your legs and running the other way. Back in 1909, there was a man named William George Jordan who published a book called The Crown of Individuality. And within the layers of that book, there was a chapter he had written called Running Away from Life. Now, Jordan was an editor for Ladies Home Journal and the Saturday Evening Post, among many other things. He was a well-respected writer, author, and lecturer in his day. He was known as a great thinker, and I would actually categorize him as, as probably the greatest philosopher of that age. But I want to share with you his, his uh, chapter called Running Away From Life, and I think you'll get a lot out of it. So pay close attention. To fight life's battles, one must keep close to the firing line. Pain, sorrow, anxiety, or trouble must be fought at close range. They cannot be evaded, ignored, nor deserted. We must vanquish them, or they will vanquish us. We must look them squarely in the face and fight them to a finish. Retreat means simply deferring the battle until we are weaker, not stronger. It is running away from self, running away from life. It is as foolish as trying to dodge the atmosphere. Thousands in the world today are running away from life to escape some mental or emotional pang. They are seeking it by the road of amusement, distraction, travel, and change of scene. They seek not new wisdom to cure a wound, nor new strength to bear it, but merely some way to deaden the pain. These are in quests, not of peace, but of temporary oblivion, not self-conquest, but self-forgetfulness. They are taking emotional cocaine, which, like all powerful drugs, has a dangerous reaction. The swiftest engine in the world cannot carry us away from a grief that holds our very heart in its close, deadening pressure. No matter how rapidly the milestones are whizzed backward, we cannot escape the pain. It is snuggling close by our side and is eclipsing all the beauties of life and nature around us by its dull, insistent note. The magic spell of music may carry us for a little out of ourselves, may temporarily fill our hearts with rest, calm, and peace, may silence the voice of a forsaken duty or an unconquered pang of memory. But unless the music inspires us with the wine of new purpose, the vital impelling courage to act as we should, it has been only musical cocaine. And as we walk the streets homeward, the pain starts afresh as if the very respite had made it want to revenge itself for our forgetting. If we could pack our worries and anxieties, those restless imps that feed on our happiness and starve our souls, in storage before we set out on a travel tour, change of scene might be of real value to us. It might be a physical upbuilding, a mental refreshing, and a moral rebirth. But if our worries are going to camp out in our stateroom at night and keep us awake to listen to what they tell us and to walk the deck with us by day, they prove to us that running away has been a vain flight, not a valorous fight. If they loom so large before us that they shut out the view of the Alps and darken the skies of sunny Spain, why, we then realize we have not been fighting at all, but merely taking the same old play of our sorrows on a European tour where only the scenery is changed while the cast of emotions is the same. We constantly tilt at windmills of distraction, leaving the real battle on the field of the soul unfought. Tiring of the friends who have been near to us and whom we disqualify either because they will talk about our sorrow or they will not. We hunt up acquaintances or semi-friends of the vintage of five years ago and try society. This is only another brand of cocaine. We imagine self-deceptively that six nights a week an evening dress might of itself banish our sorrow or stifle our secret grief. But what is the use of it all if, when the evening clothes are removed, we find ourselves still in the unremoved straitjacket of memories we would give aught in the world to escape forever. The intensified pain seems even greater as we contrast our misery with the happiness of others. 
How do we know that they too are not wearing straitjackets? We become nervously, morbidly oversensitive. An innocent chance word may, in an instant, fan into flame the embers of an unconquered pain. Some simple, ordinary incident may cause the river of a sleeping emotion to rise suddenly and almost flood the soul. By some subtle electric disturbance in the brain's central office, a thousand calls of different new impressions may successively ring violently the bell of the one dominating memory that haunts us. Every road of our thought leads inevitably to the realm of our grief. We must just drop our cocaine, stop running away from life, and fight the battle, alone if alone we must, till we rise, sanctified, sweetened, and strengthened, a victor on the field of seeming defeat. Each of us has his own special enemies that would take from him the crown of his individuality. These are the times we must stand still for a little, get our bearings through the fumes and the smoke and face and fight the life that is. Some say change of scene does lull, does soothe, does cure. No. Nature may with time help us to forget, but it is usually only putting our grief or trial to sleep, if unconquered. We are left too often with scars of morbidness, dead ideals, awful regret. We are not calmed, but paralyzed in certain emotions. We are weakened. We have lost the possible strength of a victory that would make all future pain easier to bear because of finer character, confidence, and courage. In assaying our trouble, let us first see if it is really as great as it seems. We often listen to trifles of worry through a microphone of fear, where the footfall of a few flies is exaggerated till it sounds like the battling hoofs of a cavalry charge across a wooden bridge. There are petty cares that we should be ashamed of noticing. Some of them are no larger than a dewdrop, that the heat of a few seconds' clear thinking should dissipate into nothingness. These we put under the microscope of our anxiety until a microbe seems as big as a prehistoric monster. Treat these as if they were mosquitoes of fate trying to annoy the sphinx. Learn to look these troubles squarely in the eye, smile bravely, be calm, and say to them, You never even touched me. There is one great sorrow in life that carries with it a sacredness that no irreverent hand can touch lightly is a sacrifice we have to make on the altar of our love. Love, in some form, is the greatest thing in life. The others are understudies. The saddest hour is the loss of one we hold dear. It is bitterly hard when the loved one still lives, but separated forever from us, by misunderstanding, injustice, folly, love grown cold. There is that other loss, when the one most loved passes from us into the eternal silence. The death of love transmutes every high light of past joys into agonies of memory by comparison with present deadness. The death of the loved one, with love still strong, crowns their life together and makes past joys sweet, serene, and soothing in the holy of holies of memory. The first gradually eclipses the memory of joys the second the memory of sorrows, while intensifying the sweetness of remembered happiness. In either form, it speaks our supreme sorrow, the taking of the last fortress of our courage. There is one form of distraction that is not running away from life. It is in seeking to be genuinely interested in the daily lives of others, in growing more unselfish, in heartening others, and standing strong by those in need, in distributing as an administrator to all humanity the estate of love that has been ours, in deeds of cheer, constancy, helpfulness, consolation, kindness, and thoughtfulness. Let us feel in every sorrow that there is something within us, a divine spirit that rises superior to all else in life, something imperishable, unperturbed, impregnable, something that can 
no more be sullied than a ray of sunlight from the heart of the sun. Let us fight. Fight with a certainty of winning a greater, bigger, finer self. We cannot always evade the darker side of life, but we can dictate the effect we will permit it to have on us. Let us fight like Jacob of old, wrestling with the angel, and say, I will not let thee go unless thou bless me. And the angel of grief always does bless us if we battle aright. Somehow, somewhere, somewhen, the conquered sorrow is transformed into finer strength, broader sympathy, tested friendships, gentler tolerance, greater charity, and a truer vision of the realities of life. If our sorrow be inevitable, we must bear it bravely so that we may bear it easier. If we can get salvage of hope from the wreck of failure, we are lessening the loss. Often a sacrifice of petty pride will bring back all the old happiness. Fight must help. Flight? Never. Our environment is so largely the radiation of our individuality that we can never truly desert it. Running away from life is merely a coward's useless alibi.